Hello, my name is Alan Groon. I want to tell you about a village church in the Netherlands, in Heeg, in Friesland to be precise. And I was born in Heeg. I was baptized in the Reformed Church in Heeg. From time to time, I've been back there to have a look at the house where I was born and the church where I was baptized and the community in general perhaps sentimental or nostalgic uh, items drove me there. But in the past, I knew very little about this church community, but with the help of uh, internet, I've been able to find a good deal of information that I find very exciting and would love to share with you rather briefly. I wanted to know about our community and in our church particularly because every aspect of our lives the time and when we were born the culture into which we were born the languages that we learn when we're little so what factors shaped the community and what factors did that community in turn um, help to become who i am I was born a week before Hitler invaded the Netherlands, so not the most auspicious time for parents to begin to raise a little baby. The 1940s up to 1945 were war times, times of fear, concerns for lives. The entire 1940s in Friesland, probably in the rest of the Netherlands as well, were times of poverty and scarcity. In our family, I don't remember ever suffering hunger, but the provisions were sometimes quite limited. So it came to pass before too long that many in Friesland began to look to emigrate, that is leave. That also shapes the community. When a number of people talk about leaving, the community becomes less stabled. Uh, the community becomes less enmeshed. We begin to take a kind of an emotional leave. And the Netherlands in the 40s and into the early 50s was still at war. Now with a terrible war of Indonesia, Many young men from the Netherlands went to Indonesia to fight in that really dreadful war. My interest in here is what was the formative influence of the church on the community and its individuals? I found a number of interesting resources that were not available to me before. There is quite a bit of information about the church in Heeg. The church became a Doliansi church. Doliansi meaning a people who were concerned, even aggrieved about what was happening in their churches. There was a substantial essay uh, concerning the Doliansi, the grieving church in Heeg, uh, about 30 pages or so. Some years ago, I was able to borrow a copy of a substantial history of Heeg. One of the things that I learned is that the village had been in existence probably 1,200 years or maybe even longer. Unfortunately, I have no access to this book anymore. It would have been helpful. But there are many church websites that you can go to to find information about individual churches and also about denominations. So the early church, earliest church that was in Hague was the Roman Catholic Christophorus Church. Christophorus meaning Christ bearer. By the mid 18th century, around 1750, it had become uh, pretty di dilapidated and they tore it down and built a new church there and that church is now the one reformed church in the village. The village was probably originally called Haga. This latter became Heeg with a CH on the end and is now called Heeg. 
the meaning of the word is unknown. Guesses have been made to what it might mean, but there's no certainty as to what it actually means. So this is the church where I was baptized. Ichterskerk is what it was later called, the church. Ichters meaning fish from the ancient way in which Christians secretly gave themselves uh, an identity. It was built in 1891, a cruciform building in Renaissance style. The architect was a well-known architect, Chaired Kuypers, who designed quite a few church buildings for the Christian Reformed churches of the Netherlands. As of the last few years, the building is no longer used as a church, but it was sold to a developer who has nearly concluded his work of putting seven apartment units in the building. So when the concerned were no longer welcomed in the traditional Reformed Church, the time came when uh, they were no longer welcome to worship with the traditional people who had owned that building for centuries. So with the consent of a court, they had to come up with a new facility of their own. So you saw the outside. This is the liturgical center of the Christian Reformed Church of Heich, as it was until recently. I'm assuming that because of the apartment building that's taking place, it will be no longer like this. But there was a restoration of the interior of the building in 1967. The horseshoe balconies were removed, only the balcony at the back remained. All the older uh, interior furnings were removed and replaced with modern furniture. There's a fairly wide consent that the restoration was a failure. This is the church building that is now the only uh, church building where the Reformed people of Hague and the community can gather for worship, weddings, funerals, and such e church events. It's the second building on this site. I get contradictory uh, notions of the dates. Some indicate that it was built in 1840, but others that it was built actually earlier. A number of alterations were made to this building, but it is now, uh, I think, there to stay because it's also surrounded by a cemetery with many, many graves. So a few dates that are important and relevant to the concerns of the 19th century. In the year, let's uh, just grab a date in the year 1600s, you would find in the low, lowlands there were Jewish synagogues, Roman Catholic churches, Lutheran and Protestant Calvinist churches. From about 1600 to about 1800, there was plenty of turbulence in those churches with many different theologians having different points of view on all, many issues. One of the most interesting one was the debate between the famous philosopher and math mathematician René Descartes and the theologian who many people will be familiar with his name still in the Netherlands was Gijsbertus or Gisbertus Vucius. Descartes accusing Vucius of scholasticism and Vucius accusing Descartes of Aristotelianism. So they were both, they are saying to each other, your Christian understanding is flawed because of your lo loyalty to those two different mindsets. The scholastic views greatly influenced orthodox theology. The word scholastic has in it the word for school. And what they meant to say with that, that uh, the theologians wanted to hold on to the old schools of thinking uh, it, that maybe come from the 13th, 14th century. And they thought that these were very close to the truth and there wasn't much alteration to be made to their thinking. Well, early in the 19th century, uh, King William I 
got involved in church order and church affairs in general. In uh, his early reign, he said he abolished the use of the church order of 1618 and 1619 and imposed a new church order of his own, which gave the crown a lot of authority to control the affairs of the state, uh, to, to control the affairs of the church, excuse me. The state, the crown, now began to have the kind of informative and formative influence on the state church that they could appoint preachers to congregations, and those were sometimes serious mismatches. You might have a very conservative, traditional, rural church have a pastor imposed on them who had a very liberal theological education. In 1834, the king's interference in church affairs had become so unwelcome that many decided they wanted to split from the ch state church, even though that was illegal, and even though it meant that they no longer could count on the financial support of the state for their church affairs. So a number of leaders uh, had a big influence on starting an 1834 uh, church, which in Dutch was called afscheiding, which means simply separation. They're separating themselves from the state church. And a number of these leaders are known to Christian Reformed people, especially in the United Church, in the United States, so sorry, in the United States, took the name of that uh, denomination, Christian Reformed, with them, and the mindset was that of the separation of the of the church from the state. So uh, the strong theme in this is we don't want anything to do uh, with the state. So there were some theologians that had become very influential in all of Friesland and probably in most of the Netherlands as well. It, they were called the School of the Groninger Theologians. In Groningen there, was, there is and still a, a well-known university. The city of Groningen is a university town and there was similar ways of thinking arose in Leiden, the theological school there in the mid-19th century. And the teaching of the theologians and consequently also by the pastors whom they trained was influenced a lot by German liberal theologians. They were not interested in the old teachings. They did not like the traditional understanding of the person and ministry of Jesus. Jesus was not the Redeemer, he was not the incarnate Son of God, but he was a great example for people to follow. Jesus was by nature someone who nurtured people and who educated people, but he was not a person to liberate them or forgive their sins. That wasn't really all that necessary either. And people have to just buck up their courage uh, to, to please God as best that they could and live with that. Now, by the time you get to 1850, there were a lot of people who found these teachings unacceptable. And so revival broke out in Friesland with two villages, not city churches, villages that provided remarkable leadership in a revival uh, towards the more traditional Orthodox faith. The first is Heich of all places. And not far away, there's a small village close to Snake, it's called Osthem. And there too, uh, a, a big impetus arose to uh, have a revival which would spread throughout Friesland. And indeed, that did happen. So the churches 
became very closely tied to the Belgic Confession, the Heidelberg Catechism, um, the Canons of Dort, and so forth again. But the, theolo the theological cons concerns that moved them now also began to develop for many their own sense of problems. You can be very orthodox and still be pretty limited as to your understanding of what the gospel of Jesus Christ uh, means. So overall, as I recall, and as many recall, it was a deterministic theology. Pretty much everything is determined by God ahead of time. And if that's true, it sorely limits human freedom. But people have the sense that we do have much decision-making power over our own lives. So there was a dissonance between the deterministic theology of the church and the sense of being free that moves people. If there is, a, if God determines everything, what is the role of prayer? And what can we do but resign? So there was a problem there, often summarized by people in this way. Preach like a Calvinist, pray like an Arminian. Calvin being the person allegedly for predeterminism and Arminius the thinker of human freedom. So it shows up in a number of ways. God chooses, or he does not choose, individuals to be saved. And there's not much you can do about that. The related doctrine, the doctrine of providence, says that everything that happens is directed by God's power. Even terrible things reflect the will of God. This, of course, becomes very difficult when you begin to think of some of the events that these people in Haig had been through in the Second World War, and many in the Netherlands, of course, as you know, suffered greatly. How can that be explained by saying it was God's will? Determinism leaves much of the Bible to one side, if we take it seriously in any case. It leaves faith, obedience, justice, care for other people, care for the environment, it leaves them all kind of hanging. It also tended to get people stuck with legalism and moralism, which threaten the gospel. There was, for example, a very strict sabbatical attitude. Uh, as on Sunday, many people would draw the drapes. You wouldn't be able to see outside. You wouldn't be tempted to go and play with your other children outside. And it became very moralistic. We, we knew exactly what was forbidden. And often those were more personal than systematic items. So there was the continued scholasticism. All that the church teaches has to fit into one neat logical package. And in that case, the Bible becomes like a, a puzzle that you are to take out of a box and then fit together. And every piece has to fit. And when you pay careful attention to scripture, you'll notice in that sense, not everything fits. In the meanwhile, what was going on in the Christian Reformed Church of Haig? I mentioned revival began in the, around 1850. A pastor by the name of Felix, his last name Felix, came to Haig. He persuaded the church at that time, which was the only church, the older building that I showed you, he persuaded the church that to be a preacher or an office bearer, you would have to sign the form of subscription. That is, you'd have to put your name under a form that says that you agree with everything that is uh, taught in those three forms of unity 
and that you were not to to stray from them. And there was a process put in place that said, this is what you are to do if you don't agree, but it's so arduous that people often just didn't bother. This pastor, Felix, must have been a, a very charismatic and industrious pastor, but he also organized a society of friends for the truth. He held prayer services on a regular basis. He organized mission work, Sunday schools, young people societies, and in addition to the pastoring of the church, he edited a monthly magazine. That went well until about 1887, when under the leadership of a new pastor, Pastor Wagenaar, a large group of the Reformed congregation joined the movement of the concerned. This movement was called the Nederdeutsch Gereformeerde Kerk. I'm not sure how to translate Nederdeutsch. It means something, I guess, like Pladdeutsch, maybe not, Reformed Church. And this was eventually simply called the Reformed Church. Now, a small number of the original congregation, now called the Haga Church, uh, remained. They, by and large, agreed with the uh, people of concern, but they said it doesn't give us sufficient re reason to start a new congregation, and they stayed. So, at the time came as well when they said to this larger group, uh, if you want to worship differently from us and teach differently from what we do, then go find your own place to worship. So the new group had to provide their own facility for worship and a smaller group left behind in the original Reformed Church. Interestingly, several concerned members from nearby small villages were given permission to have their children attend catechism class in the new church building. So the Reformed Church experienced two church splits. The Reformed Church of 1834, because of the over-involvement of the state in the affairs of the church, and the Church of the Aggrieved, they left because of the theological issues. The church had become too liberal and they wanted to move away from that. Then from that, that concerned church, there was again a split. In 1944, there was the beginning of the Reformed churches in the Netherlands liberated. That was the name they gave themselves. And uh, the, the controversy was between the teaching of Klaas Schilder and Abraham Kuyper. Klaas Schilder disagreed with Abraham Kuyper about baptism. Kuyper said, when children are baptized, we may presume that they've been born again. And Schilder said, that's a big problem to me. It's not right. Uh, we cannot presume that they're born again. And quite a number of people agreed with Schilder. So you have the Reformed churches in the Netherlands liberated. And then in 2004, the Protestant churches of the Netherlands had again all sorts of stuff going on. The churches were generally dwindling in membership and a union was made of Samen op Weg, they called it, Together on the Way. The Netherlands Reformed Churches, the Christian Reformed Churches, the Lutheran Churches, and the Walloon Churches uh, became that new movement. But about 100,000 members of those churches decided they could not join that new movement. Now I want to talk a bit about the demise of the Reformed Church in Haag. Late 1940s, people began to talk about emigration. They hoped for a more prosperous future, especially for their sons and daughters. And one day, I remember that, the pastor of our church announced that one of the families of the congregation 
was going to be moving to Australia. Well, they were not the only ones talking about moving, but I don't know exactly how many actually left. Quite a few, I think. So that meant a decline in church membership for obvious and uh, were valid reasons. Our family left Hague in 1951 to go to Canada. In the 1960s, fewer showed up at church for other reasons. I'm kind of guessing here, but I think it's by and large a reasonable guess. The church had less control over what people did on Sundays as people began to say, well, we're not so sure about everything the church teaches. And so they began to go sailing in Hague. They played soccer. They went for outings and family gatherings. There was also, I think, something like what we experienced in Quebec in the 1960s, the Quiet Revolution, it's often called. Secularism hit hard. The church can tell us whatever they want, is what they said in Quebec, and something like that in the Netherlands as well. But they can go uh, whistle for all we care. For some at least, the strict doctrines of election and providence did not seem credible. As an aftermath of World War II, belief in God in general was no longer held to be credible by many. By the mid-1980s, only a small group of that original substantial congregation that was still substantial in 1945, the attendance had dwindled greatly. So the next step of the Reformed and the Christian Reformed Church in Hague was that they began to meet together. One Sunday in the old church, one Sunday in the new church. That didn't really work either. So the big newer church was closed. Protestants now meet only in the Haga church. By about 2020 or maybe a little earlier, the building was sold and is now being built into an apartment complex. But the story of Hague is by no means unique. There were a number of other churches that I found had the same story. And I suppose if I were to continue to troll the internet, I'd find more stories. I, you see here the picture of a church in Amsterdam. It was called the Funen Church. It was named that way because it was on, up opposite the street from Funen Park. It was built in 1890, 1889 and was torn down in 1974, partly at least because they jo joined another congregation called the Muiderkerk. These two churches did a lot of co cooperating and the Muiderkerk con continues to exist today but with very few of those original uh, conservative confessional members. In the nearby city of Snake, about 10 kilometers from Hague, during that time four of the concerned groups built their own buildings. Grandpa Groen was an elder in the Zuiderkerk, and then you had three others, the church on the east side of the city, on the north side of the city, and something called, like in Heeg, the Echtes Church. These four buildings have now all closed. They're torn down or repurposed. The last of the ones to close, I believe, was the Zuiderkerk. It had been built, enlarged, and now closed. Now, in the city of Snake, all the Protestants have a new church home in the Martinikerk, which is a historic, large, beautiful old building from maybe 1150 or thereabouts. That building has not been altered. 
and they're not going to alter it, but they are building a number of uh, facilities around it for educational purposes and the like. These churches, such as the Ichthus Church, were also a blessing to many. While the churches were often inflexible, they kept the creeds as essential rather than to falling in liberal modes. That, to me, is a good thing. Heeg joined the new de denomination under some conditions. They wanted the new denomination to appoint from the get-go a missions committee, and this was to serve not only to spread the gospel, but also to gather funds to provide for the poor and needy. From day one, that was important to them. The robust singing of almost exclusively Genevan psalmody moved me as a boy very deeply. There was also a sense of mutual burden bearing to help people weather the storms of life. And as there were many storms in the Netherlands, the 1930s were also very difficult years and it only got worse in the 1940s. Many of the st sturdy, stubborn Protestants could also be counted on to help Jewish refugees, even though they knew that sheltering Jews in your home could be dangerous to life and limb. To be a confessional church is a good thing to me. It hinders, gets in the way, especially of pastors and elders just kind of going off on tangents of their own. But it's of course also to hold them so rigidly that they become like a cement block around you. So uh, throwing out the baby of the confessionals and so forth with the bath water is not an option for me. But the tradition can and should be criticized and amended where necessary. Because these churches followed the teachings of Abraham Kuyper, they also became in, got involved in many important aspects of all of life. That was Kuyper's mantra. Every square inch of life belongs to God. Politics, labor, education, you name it. And remarkably, when Abraham was Abram Kuyper was prime minister in the Netherlands now more than a hundred years ago, he managed also to push through legislation to provide health care for everyone. There's a question or two that I still struggle with. Is there a good middle way between scholasticism and fundamentalism, which I take to be a form of scholasticism, and liberalism. Is there a gospel middle way that helps us to find our way to what it means to be human, what it means to be a good community? And is that what in our current struggles, what the Christian Reformed Church is trying to find, a way between a certain rigid stay put at all cost and finding the freedom to say, you know, we need to think a little bit differently and uh, come to different conclusions, being on the same road, but further down that road. Thanks for listening.